Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Uh, what a wonderful reminder there in song that indeed the blood will never lose its power. Uh, thank you, Elder Zuzo, for that uh, introduction. Um, you know, in recent years, a funny thing has started to happen. You know, when I'm introduced, I get a little bit concerned sometimes that, you know, people only get to hear uh, uh, the highlights of the story. And so I want you to know that I am clear that if anything good has happened in my life, it is because of the grace of God. Um, I want to thank Elder Zuzo and his wife for this uh, uh, invitation to spend a few moments with you. And I pray that um, although we're together virtually, that the blessing might be real. I think the last time I saw uh, Elder Zuzo in person was um, on a Sabbath where he was supposed to be quote unquote retiring <laughs> from uh, his position as an elder. And, you know, I, I was warned that um, I should take that uh, that word retirement with a grain of salt. And I see that uh, he's still quite busy. And then I praise God that uh, he continues to give you and your wife both um, strength to continue your work uh, in your part of the vineyard. Um, and I want to also extend greetings to those of you who are overseas. I was joking with some friends this week. Um, you know, I don't know if this means that I can say uh, that I have preached in South Africa, uh, but uh, I think I, I may use that, um, you know, from, from here on out. Um, but uh, with that, let's uh, go ahead and uh, let's pray and turn our attention to the word of God. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to take a few moments um, in scripture, uh, looking at your word, God, and we just ask now that as we open the, the pages of scripture that your truth uh, would become real to us, dear God. You know what each and every one of us stand in need of. And so I pray, dear Lord, that whatever the need is that is present at this moment, God, that it might be filled and that your will might be done. We thank you for your love and we thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I was asked to share a little bit uh, about COVID um, this afternoon. I passed on some materials to Sister Zuzo, some of which you will uh, see next week. But I did want to start by saying that at least here in the United States, we are currently wrapping up what has been the worst week to date for coronavirus infections. In fact, um, for those of you who've been looking at the daily totals, um, yesterday uh, was a new one day record for new infections, right? And we were right at about 100,000 people. And that was just on yesterday. And if you've been looking at the news this week, you see that uh, maybe since about Monday or Tuesday, every day, uh, consecutively, we'd been setting new one-day infection uh, uh, records. Uh, total, to date, in the United States, we have had uh, about 9 million total cases since the data has started to be recorded back in March. Over the last 15 days alone, uh, just over two weeks, there have been 1 million new infections. And currently, as of the last count yesterday, we are at an official death total of 230,000 deaths, a number that is sure to climb in the days ahead. And so we here in America, like many of you uh, in South Africa and wherever else you might be listening, have been fighting this new pandemic. But maybe a, a slight difference here in the United States is that over the past few months, we've actually been fighting two pandemics. And while the COVID pandemic has been new, unfortunately, the other pandemic is really quite old. In February 2020, a young man by the name of Ahmad Arbery went for a jog near his home. 
he was pursued and fatally shot by some men who thought that perhaps he broke into a home just going for a run. And then in March 2020, a 26-year-old EMT by the name of Brianna Taylor was asleep in her bed. When plain clothes, police officers kicked in the door in the middle of the night and shot her to death. And then on May 25th, the world looked on in horror as a police officer knelt on the neck of a man by the name of George Floyd, slowly squeezing the life out of his body over the course of the next eight minutes and 46 seconds. Two pandemics, one new and the other quite old. And there might be some who, who, who see these events over the last several days and, and, and maybe think it's new, but the fact is that if you are a conscientious observer of, of history and you view uh, uh, these killings through the lens of history, it is easy to see that even though it has been 157 years since the Emancipation Proclamation that many black and brown people in our society are still fighting for full participation in American democracy, still fighting to demonstrate that, uh, that we are people and not property, still fighting for society to fully and completely agree that indeed Black lives do matter. Two pandemics, one new and one old. And the fact is, if we look at our church, in much the same way as the rest of society, we also have been fighting two pandemics over the last few years, one new and one old. The last several years have seen the rise of what is now being referred to as Christian nationalism. It might be a new phrase for some of you. In a new book, which just came out a few months ago called Taking America Back for God, two authors by the name of Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry unpack the machinery of Christian nationalism. The key deceit they posit of Christian nationalism is that it is about religion. However, on closer look, what you find is that Christian nationalism merely uses the Bible to impose its conservative political agenda. Christian nationalism marginalizes those who do not conform to an order that reverences the traditional family, militarism, closed borders, and white Protestant supremacy. And over the past four years, those of you who've been paying attention to what's been going on in our country have seen that the president has actually reshaped the surface of American Christianity by elevating the profile of Christian nationalism. So much so that uh, just speaking for myself, not speaking for anyone else, but today as a Christian in America in, in 2020, I am actually at the place where I no longer want people to know when I'm meeting them for the first time that I am a Christian until they get the chance to know me. Am I ashamed of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. But what I am ashamed of is the fact that in America in 2020, the message of the gospel has been so co-opted that when people who are not Christian now hear the word Christian, they no longer think someone who is compassionate. They no longer think of someone who is forgiving. They no longer think of someone who cares for the poor and the needy. They no longer think of the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. When people hear Christian in America in 2020, what they hear now is someone who is probably against getting vaccinations. They, they hear Christian and they think of someone who says, you don't need to wear a mask in public even though the pandemic is raging. When they hear the term Christian, they think about people who hate gay people but love guns. Brothers and sisters, may I remind us this afternoon that the gospel of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with guns 
whether or not you wear a mask, it has nothing to do with vaccinations or, or, or sexual orientation. It has nothing to do with your political party affiliation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for by grace you have been saved and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is beloved. Let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested that God sent his son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we find that our church is in a pandemic of an identity crisis. But it really is just a newer iteration of an old problem. In fact, when you go back to look at the early church uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that when Peter showed up to Antioch, he says he withstood him to his face because Peter would hang out with the Christians who were, who were previously Gentiles when the Jewish Christians weren't around. But when the Christians who were previously Jews showed up, he would not hang out with them. And so Paul showed up and he's told Peter, wait, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Either we are saved uh, by grace or we're saved by works, but it can't be both. And so even in the early church, there was a, a, a wrestling over what is the message of Christianity. And then of course, throughout the years, there were other doctrines that crept in. Some folks began to say, you know, when your loved one dies, you know, they can go to heaven or they can go to hell or, you know, there's a place in between called purgatory. And maybe if you just buy this candle and light it, you can help them get out of purgatory. Others began to say, well, you know, you can't really approach God directly and ask for forgiveness. You need to talk to this man and this man will talk to God for you and he'll tell you what God would have you to do. And then there were others who said, you know, it's best probably if you don't read the Bible for yourself, you should just let the priest interpret that for you. And so over time, God raised up reformers who helped clarify again the message of the gospel. And today now in 2020, as those of us who call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, God is asking us to help fight this old pandemic of confusing the message of Christianity by showing the world what Christianity is really about. The three angels message at its core, the message that produces the great harvest of righteousness really is the message of righteousness by faith. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Come buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Come buy white garments that you may be clothed. That is the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, the, the, and so God is, is looking at us and he's saying, I need you to help show the world what it is that I am really about. I need you to be my hands. I need you to be my feet. God tells us in Matthew chapter 25 that at the end of the day when he sits down, when he's deciding between the sheep and the goats, he will look at the sheep and say, when I was hungry, you gave me food, thirsty. You gave me a drink, a stranger. You took me in. That is the message of the gospel. And so as seven-day Adventists who are looking forward to the soon coming of Christ, who are trying to do our part in spreading the, th the third angel's message, our duty is to help fight this old pandemic by showing the world what Jesus Christ is really about. But at the same time as we fight this old pandemic, the church is actually also fighting a newer pandemic. And that is that as a church, we are no longer experiencing meaningful growth. Now, traditionally, this has been worse in the United States. 
at our last general conference session in, in 2015, 47% of the delegation from the North American division was 60 years of age or older, making the North American delegation the oldest delegation at the general conference. The median age of a person, any person, is North, uh, in North America is 38 years old. But the median age of a church member in the North American division is 51 years of age. Our church, particularly in North America, is graying. And we're finding that we are having a difficult time not only evangelizing the community around us, but in passing the message on to our children. And as I said before, initially this was something that we kind of viewed as an American problem. We looked at other divisions around the world and said the gospel is going forth by leaps and bounds. And in many places, it still is. But when you have some time this afternoon or maybe tomorrow, go to Adventist statistics.org. It gives you the statistics of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if you actually click on the statistics under interesting facts on the home page, you look at the 29 statistics, the growth rate of the world church was 0.66%, less than 1%, meaning that in 2019, the, the world church effectively did not grow. Now, for some of you, that may be sur surprising to hear, but for many of us across North America, we've had the chance to, to travel around a little bit. We've seen that same thing in our churches, where you may pull up to a church on a Sabbath morning and the lights may be on outside and the grass may be cut in the yard. But when you get inside the church, 10, maybe 12 people. And so we're in a place now where the church isn't growing as it ought. And, and there have been many think groups and many discussions about why this is the case. But this afternoon, I want to show you a very short answer from the word of God. And that answer, this is the only verse I'll ask you to look at this afternoon, because I want you to see it for yourself. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And Actually, I'll start at uh, verse 44. The Bible says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now, here's the answer. The Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily. It didn't say people added to the church daily. It didn't say programs added to the church daily. The Bible says that God added to the church daily. It is God's, God's power. That, that, that causes the church to grow. And the fact is that, that, that the reason our church isn't growing is because we have not fully harnessed the power of God. The fact of the matter is that people uh, 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 need to see God's power because everything else that church offers, you can find somewhere else. If you want to just find intimate, loving relationships, there are lots of community clubs where you can go and do that. If you want to hear good music, you can find that online or, or at, a, at a concert hall. If you just want to hear somebody speak for a few minutes, there's lots of places you can do that. If you want to be involved in bettering your community, there's, there's community organizations galore. But the thing that is supposed to distinguish the church from every other organization around it is the presence of the power of God. That's what causes the church to grow. 
if you invite me to your house and you say that you, you, you're gonna make a sandwich for me to eat, it doesn't matter if you, break, if you baked the bread yourself. It doesn't matter if you went out to your garden and picked the, the lettuce and the tomatoes and the onions. It doesn't matter if you, you mixed the, the ketchup or the barbecue sauce in the basement yourself. If the sandwich does not have any meat, at the end of the day, it's still deficient. And so people are asking, where is the meat? We can get all of these other things somewhere else, but we want to see the power of God. And so I want to just share three quick principles and I'll get out your way. You know, I, uh, as you have heard, I'm, I'm a scientist, you know, as, as well as a physician. So I'm always seeing uh, uh, God's um, uh, careful planning and play when I look at, at science and nature. And so one of the things that I have to know a little bit about is electricity. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, but because of the, some of the things I do, I need to know a little bit about electricity. And there are really three basic principles that are important to know about electricity, right? And what you find is that these same principles are in play when it comes to God's power. The first principle is that electricity, power, always seeks a pathway to the ground. When you look at your electrical outlet, you see those two small slits, but typically just below that is a rounder uh, sort of opening, which is the, the connection to the ground. Because the, the, the propensity of electricity is to seek the ground. And so that ground allows the, the power to leave the house in a safe manner. Brothers and sisters, if you want to connect with the power of God, you must find your way to the ground. The Bible tells us that when Jesus walked the earth, that he would wake up way before morning and he would go out and find himself in prayer with God. Jesus never sinned. And so if Jesus never sinned, but he still felt the need to connect in prayer with his father before starting his day, how much more those of us here in 2020 need to find ourselves in prayer. If you want to connect with God's power, you must find your way to the ground. Prayer is where you connect with power. My grandmother, uh, when she was alive and, and up and about, she spent many of her years chasing demons around the island of Antigua. And I remember when she would tell some of us some of those stories as kids, I mean, uh, just scared, right? I can remember one week I slept in my brother's bed every night after hearing her stories. And I often wondered as I was growing, where she got the power for that? And I, I'll never forget one, one morning listening to her pray. And she was praying outside so loudly that if you were anywhere on the sidewalk or walking by, you could hear her. She prayed with with urgency, she called people by name and God told me that's it. That's where the power comes. And so if you wanna connect with power, you gotta find your way to the ground. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. So if you wanna connect with power, you have to find your way to the ground. Principle number two, Electricity must complete a circuit to do work. There's got to be a circuit for power, power to be useful. Much in the same way, there is something that happens, and I don't know why God set this up the way he did, but he just did. There is something that happens when you pray with others that does not happen when you pray by yourself. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19, I say to you that if any two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Yes, it is important to pray by yourself, but it's also important to be part of a circuit. I have said this before. I have read through this book 
And there are no examples of someone being healed by God without at least one other person being involved. When you read the story of Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, he prays to God and says, God, please heal me. Please extend my life. And God sends Isaiah to deliver the message of healing. When Saul was blinded in Acts chapter 9, God could have simply heard his prayer and healed his vision. But he said, no, I'm sending Ananias to you. He will pray for you and you will be healed. There are always at least two people in every example of healing in scripture. Our churches need to be circuits so that the power of God can flow through. And lastly, point number three, electricity. Power always takes the path of least resistance. Power always takes the path of least resistance. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus showed up at Jairus' house. And he said that, all of you who are in here who, who, who are laughing or, or, or ridicule, ridiculing us, you need to leave. And the only people who are allowed in were Peter, James, and John because Jesus said, I, I, I need the power to flow. I don't need resistance right now. I need the power to be able to flow. Put everyone else out except for Peter, James, and John. Power always takes the, the path of least resistance. And the fact is faith is the wire that allows power to flow. Faith is the, is the wire that allows power to flow. In Matthew 9, verse 27, two blind men found Jesus and asked him for healing. And Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? And they said, yes. And then Jesus replied to them, according to your faith, be it unto you. In other words, I know I have the power, but do you have the faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. Weak faith provides resistance to the power of God. In Mark chapter 6 Verses 5 and 6, the Bible tells us that Jesus could do no mighty work in his hometown. And the reason that he could not is because of their unbelief. Now, just consider for a second how amazing that is. This is the same Jesus that stepped out into darkness in Genesis chapter 1 and commanded light to come into existence. And photons and neutrons began to assemble themselves into light. This is the same God who spoke and said, ocean, you go there, and land, you go there, and sky, you go there. This is the God of the mountains and the valleys, the God who can stand over a dead man's grave and call him to life. This is the God who turns midnight into morning and darkens day into night. And the Bible says that in his hometown, he could do no great work because of their unbelief. If you want to see God's power flow, you have to be willing to put your faith on stretch. You know, as human beings, we have five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. And if I was to ask any of you to give up one of those senses, none of you would say sight. Because as human beings, we privilege sight. But the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith is choosing to privilege what you hear over what you can see. Faith is choosing to allow what God told you to dictate your actions rather than what you see around you. And so, if you decide to walk by faith, there will be times where you will have to say, I know what I see, but I'm going with what I heard. I see that, that, that people are being laid off for their jobs all around me, but what I heard is, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. And so 
For those of you who are listening this afternoon and you need to connect with the power of God, it may be for you that you need someone else to pray with. Make a decision this week to find a prayer partner or, or, or a trusted church member that so you can find yourself uh, in a circuit so that God's power can flow. Some of you may just need more individual prayer. Make it a point this week to carve out some time for God in the morning if you can, because that was the example that Jesus left us. And then for some of you, your prayer this afternoon might be God. Like the poor man said, increase my faith. Wherever you are this, 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 this afternoon, make it a decision. Make it a point this week to connect with the power of God. May God bless you.